Hi, I'm Alan Rogers, and welcome to the Midweek Bible Study from New Salem Baptist Church. Before we jump into this week's study, the day we record this happens to be March 17th, also known as St. Patrick's Day. Now, even though I only have a tiny sliver of Irish ancestry, St. Patrick is one of my favorite figures in history. And if you aren't familiar with his fascinating story, let me encourage you to get to know him. I'm going to post a link in the description that will allow you to read his amazing story in his own words. Now, on with our study. In 1988, singer and composer Bobby McFerrin released a song which rapidly became the number one pop song in the country for a while. The catchy little tune exhorted listeners with one simple piece of advice. Don't worry, be happy. Uh, have you ever tried to just be happy? Sometimes it's a lot harder than it sounds, isn't it? Have you ever tried to keep yourself from worrying? How'd that work out for you? In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the opening paragraph contains a list of attributes that have come to be known as the Beatitudes. The name comes from the formula that characterizes each statement. Blessed are you, or to put it in a little more ancient form, blessed be you, if you possess this particular attribute. Each of the Beatitudes indicates a condition that will exist if the attribute in question is possessed. For example, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A lot of times we approach these Beatitudes with the same spirit in which we listen to the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. We determine that if we're going to realize the condition, then we need to cultivate this attitude. So we reach deep down inside ourselves, we grab our bootstraps, and by sheer force of will, we try to force ourselves to have the attitude that Jesus described. And more often than not, we fail. To be honest, sometimes we can approximate for a moment what it's like to be poor in spirit, or gentle, or merciful, but we find we can't do it perfectly, nor can we keep it up for very long. It works out about as well as when we try not to worry and be happy. When we try to turn the Beatitudes into a simple list of do's and don'ts that we try to impose on ourselves, we miss the point about what the Beatitudes are really all about. We also miss a key ingredient that makes these attitudes and their resulting conditions possible. So, what are the Beatitudes, and how can we experience them in our own lives? Well, first, a little word of introduction, and then we'll walk our way through these attitudes. You have to understand the Beatitudes are a measure of our progress in discipleship. As we discovered last time, the Sermon on the Mount, which includes the Beatitudes, is not just another list of religious regulations. The Sermon on the Mount is a description of what it's like to live under the rule and reign of God. In other words, to be part of the kingdom of God. As such, the Sermon on the Mount is a pattern of discipleship or followership. It's intended for those who have made a conscious decision to follow Jesus in faith. As Jesus says in John 3 verse 3, we can't even see the kingdom of God unless we experience a spiritual rebirth. According to John 3.16, that spiritual rebirth only comes when we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We have to come to a, a point of conscious choice in which we accept who Jesus claimed to be and what he claimed to do on our behalf. And this belief involves more than a simple intellectual assent to a set of facts. Rather, it's a reordering of our lives around the reality of who Jesus is. As we've mentioned before, faith equals knowledge plus action. We take what we know about Jesus and we act on it. That is faith. We also know the Sermon on the Mount is a measure of discipleship because of who it was addressed to and what it was based on. As we noted the last time, uh, the Sermon on the Mount was delivered to Jesus' disciples, with the rest of the crowd sitting around listening in. The sermon was addressed to people who were willing to suffer for Jesus' sake. In other words, they had bought in. They were committed. Jesus defines discipleship as the willingness to deny oneself, take up the cross, in other words, put your life on the line, and follow him. That's pretty committed. The goal of the disciple is to reflect the master. The very name Christian means little Christ. Now, when you look at it in this light, the Beatitudes become a mirror through which we can gauge how well we are reflecting the Lord Jesus. Jesus uses the formula, if you possess this attitude, then you are blessed. And this is what your blessing looks like. 
The conditions attached to each beatitude are not rewards, but definitions of the form our blessedness takes. The Beatitudes themselves are the rewards of developing a deeper relationship with Jesus. In other words, the Beatitudes are grounded in a right relationship with God through Christ. If we are pursuing a relationship with Jesus, these Beatitudes will develop in our lives naturally. Now, with that understanding, let's begin to walk through some of these attitudes Jesus says should characterize his disciples. Starting in verse 3, in Christ, those who recognize their dependence on God will receive acceptance by God. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Note that this beatitude refers not just to the poor, but to the poor in spirit specifically. Those who are poor in spirit realize that when it comes to God, they've got nothing to offer. As the prophet Isaiah said, for all of us have become like one who's unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. In other words, even our best efforts offer, co compared next to God's holiness are like dirty laundry. We've got nothing to put on the table. Being reconciled with God involves an unconditional surrender on our part. Realizing we have nothing to offer him, we simply have to accept what God offers to us. With God, we can't negotiate from a position of strength because compared to Him, we have none. So let's put an end to any notion that a person must be good enough to come to God. So many times I hear people say, well, I can't come to God yet. I still got some stuff I got to work out. Just stop it, okay? You're never going to be good enough. So quit letting that be an excuse. Come to God anyway, not on the basis of what you've done, but on the basis of what He has done for you. To come to God, we have to admit our need, admit that we are absolute beggars when it comes to Him, and we have to come to Him on His terms. And His terms involve approaching Him through Jesus. As Jesus Himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In other words, Jesus is the doorway through which we approach God. The Apostle Peter put it this way in Acts 4, verse 12, and there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved, that is, other than Jesus. The Apostle Paul describes the position of those who thought they could impress God with their own righteousness in Romans 10, verses 3 and 4, where he says, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's another way of saying that our righteousness doesn't cut it as far as God's righteousness is concerned. We can never be good enough, but through faith, Christ becomes our righteousness. He becomes our entrance. Now, let's do a quick gut check, okay? What are you really trusting in for your security? Is it what's in your bank account? Is it what's on your resume? Is it who you're in relationship with? Or are you able to acknowledge your own weakness and throw yourself on God's mercy? Likewise, when you read something in the Bible that challenges your self-image or your self-understanding, do you resist it? You say, well, that's old fashioned, or you know, I think we ought to do things differently, or maybe we need to update that, or do you look at what the Bible says and do you repent and seek to conform to it? It's only when we truly recognize our spiritual poverty that the doors open for us to experience the kingdom of God. Moving on, in verse 4, we find out in Christ, those who mourn over the brokenness of this world will receive wholeness from God. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In the context of the Sermon on the Mount, those who mourn are not just those who are sad. Instead, it's those who are disturbed by the spiritual condition of the world. When you look at the world around you and you see that God is not honored, that people are doing their own thing apart from a relationship with Him, that there's so much spiritual darkness around, does that bother you? Does that make you uneasy? That's what it means to mourn over the brokenness of the world. Those who mourn look around and realize that this world is not as it was intended to be. And they long for God to do something about it. I remember in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, a TV reporter interviewed a survivor who looked at the camera and asked, 
Where was God when this happened? Well, in an answer to that, consider the words of Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, where the prophet said, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Isaiah's words refer to the hope that one day God would send a Savior to remove the curse of sin and restore true justice and peace. As Luke reports in his gospel, in Luke 4, verses 14 through 20, Jesus used this very passage from Isaiah to announce the launch of his public ministry there in his home synagogue of Nazareth. In other words, Jesus was saying, this is what I'm all about. It's announcing that God's finally moving to bring about that comfort to those who are mourning. Those who are trusting in Jesus receive a foretaste of that restoration in their own lives, with the promise that the full restoration will come when Jesus returns. Moving on to verse 5, we see that those who are in Christ, who humble themselves before God, receive their stature from God. Jesus says, Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. The word translated there, gentle, can also be translated humble or meek. Now, contrary to conventional wisdom, being meek is not the same thing as being weak. Moses was called the meekest man on earth, according to Numbers 12.3, and no one's ever accused him of being weak. I mean, here's a guy who led half a million people through the desert for 40 years, got them from where they were to where they needed to be, and saw a lot of victories in the process. Jesus promotes meekness, and I don't think anyone has ever accused him of being weak either. Meekness refers to someone who does not seek to promote themselves, but instead puts their trust in God. Uh, for those of you who are fans of the Marvel movies, in the film The Age of Ultron, uh, there's a, a very touching scene between uh, Natasha Romanoff, her character, the Black Widow, and Dr. Bruce Banner, who's this mild-mannered, meek scientist who, when he becomes angry, becomes this indestructible rage monster known as the Hulk. And the Black Widow indicates to him that she's attracted to Banner because in contrast to guys who are always trying to prove her their toughness, Banner's the guy who, in her words, is always running from a fight because he knows he will win. That's an example of meekness. Those who are meek know the power behind the apostles' admonition to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. To trust in God's timing and God's power instead of trying to carve out our own niche. Uh, let's get practical for a minute, okay? Do you feel the need to always be on the top? Are you uncomfortable unless you're in control or at the center of attention? Do you get easily offended when you think other people are not giving you the proper respect? Well, those are not signs of meekness. Let me tell you, those are signs of pride. And if any of those are true, maybe you still have a little work to do in learning this meekness business, okay? But we can't hope to enjoy all that God offers us until we're okay with the fact that He's God and we're not. We can't inherit the earth until we learn to be meek. In verse 6, we see that in Christ, those who are desperate for justice receive assurance that God will set all things right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Now, I want to camp out on this one for a moment because there's a lot of talk in our society right now about issues of justice and how to address injustice. And there's all kinds of conflicting uh, proposals for how to bring that about. At the same time, there are some who say that Christians should stay out of the discussion altogether and simply focus to, uh, on filling the Great Commission. Now, I agree wholeheartedly that Jesus' followers should make fulfilling the Great Commission our main focus. However, let me remind you that in the Great Commission, which is found in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we're not only called to baptize people, that is, lead people to profess Jesus as Savior, but we're also called to train people to observe all the things that Jesus commanded. Well, guess what? Right here in Matthew 5, verse 6, we see Jesus commending those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness involves a recognition 
that something is not right in this world. This hunger is a reflection of the image of God that each of us still carries in our souls, even when we're living far from God. God is both just and righteous, and he created this world with the intent that people live in harmony both with nature and with each other. Yet, as Genesis 3 and subsequent chapters in the Bible tell us, when human beings rejected God and tried to set themselves up as their own moral authority, the results were disharmony, selfishness, strife, and death. The further we live from God, the more likely we're going to try to use other people merely as objects to satisfy our own agendas and desires. In other words, to commit injustice. To hunger and thirst for righteousness is a recognition that the world as we see it doesn't reflect the just world that God intended. There's still a memory in our souls that there's a concept of justice out there. And we look around and we see the world doesn't match that concept and it makes us a little uneasy. At its heart, the desire to see a more just and righteous world is really a good thing. The problem comes when we try to create a just world without addressing the real reasons that the world is unjust. A lot of people will seek to impose a just society from above without addressing the inner corruption that resides in every human heart. That's why every government, no matter how noble its intents, is flawed at its very core because it's a human institution. It's made up of flawed human beings and it tends to trend toward corruption and tyranny over time. Those who seek to create heaven on earth, unfortunately, all too often unleash the exact opposite. It doesn't do any good to change the system unless you address the sin that lies in each of our hearts. And only God can undo the effects of that sin through the power of the gospel. And that's why the Great Commission is so important. The true disciple trusts in God's promise to bring about a future world of true justice. While at the same time, while we're waiting for that, we work to promote justice in our own relationships, in our own little corner of the world. It all goes back to what Jesus called the Great Commandments, which can be summed up in two statements. Love God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. So let's think about that for a minute. Do you want people to treat you fairly? Most of us would probably say yes. Do you want to live in a society where you're treated fairly, where the laws and the systems are not intended to, to keep you down? Well, I think most of us would yeah, would say we want to live in a system where things are fair and open and transparent. Do you want to be judged according to your own character and not just because of the class you happen to belong to? Well, if we want those things for ourselves, then as followers of Jesus, we should also seek them for our neighbors. We should love our neighbors same way we want to be loved and we want that we love ourselves. Moving on to verse 7, in Christ we see those who receive God's mercy are able to extend mercy towards others. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. According to Matthew 18, Jesus once told a parable about a man who owed an outlandish debt to his employer, far more than he could ever repay in one lifetime. When that man pled for mercy, his employer did something incredible. He forgave that massive debt. But not too long after that, the man who'd been forgiven used the full extent of the law to go after another man who owed him a, a pittance in comparison. And when the employer heard about that, he changed his mind about forgiving the massive debt and he had the ungrateful servant thrown into prison. Through Christ, God has mercifully offered us forgiveness for a debt that we can never afford to repay. If we truly understood the mercy that God shown towards us, we'd be a lot more merciful towards those around us. That means we would seek to be a lot less judgmental, a lot more forgiving, and a lot more, more willing to meet people where they're at and to help them get to the place where God wants them to be. Imagine what it would be like to be part of a church where people could be honest about the sins they're wrestling with, where they could receive support and ask for help in their struggles against those sins. In verse 8, we see that in Christ, those who make God's kingdom their focus are able to experience the reality of his presence. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, being pure in heart means a lot more than living a morally pure life. 
It refers to being singular in our focus, particularly when that focus is knowing God and pursuing his will. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus would describe all the material things that people pursue in the quest for security and significance. In contrast, Jesus would tell his followers, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. If you really want to see God, then seek to align with the values and the priorities of God's kingdom. Next, in verse 9, in Christ, those who've been reconciled with God are called to help others experience reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Well, why is that? Why, why are those who pursue peace and try to bring people together called the sons of God? Well, when you look at 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 and 19, you see what God's done for us. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So when we are working to help people be reconciled first to God and then with each other, we're doing the same kind of work that our Heavenly Father is about. Paul uh, describes this a little further in Galatians 3, verse 13, where he says, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. That forgiveness is the basis for making peace. Until we are able to confess how we've hurt other people, and until we are able to forgive the ways that other people have hurt us, there can't be any peace. In verses 10 and 11, we see those who suffer for Christ's sake have the assurance that no matter what is done to their bodies, no one can destroy their place in God's kingdom. Jesus says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil about you because of me. These two Beatitudes show, that, uh, show the most clearly why a personal faith relationship with Jesus is critical to realizing all of these conditions. If we seek to bring about these attitudes under our own strength, not only are we doomed to fail, we're doomed to perish. Because sacrificing ourselves for the sake of Christ only makes sense if we're trusting that Christ can redeem us for eternity. Uh, that's what gives our sacrifice meaning. If Jesus really was who he claimed to be, and really did what he claimed to do, then there's nothing this world can do to us that will ever truly destroy us, because he's never going to let go of us. The Beatitudes finally are a reminder that the investment we make in God's eternal kingdom can never be eliminated or exhausted. In verse 12, Jesus says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Identifying with Jesus often comes at a price. But you know what? He's worth it. When you look at yourself against the mirror of the Beatitudes, what do you see? Remember, if you want to see these qualities and conditions in your life, the way to pursue that is to pursue a personal relationship with Christ through faith. As you grow in that relationship, you're going to find that a lot of these qualities will develop in you naturally. Now, if you'd like to know more about what it means to pursue a relationship with Jesus, please reach out to me at pastor at newsalembaptist.net or post a question in the comments. If you found this video helpful, please help us bring it to more people by giving us a like and by sharing it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe as well uh, so you'll be notified when we post our next video. Speaking of, the next time we're going to explore what Jesus said about how his followers should interact with the world. So until then, let me leave you with a blessing based on an ancient Irish prayer. May the Lord be your vision, outshining everything else by comparison. May the Lord be your best thought by day or by night, and may his presence always be your light.